projects in HR. Whether it's passive talent or it's active talent. That's a soft skill that really gets undersold in the hiring process. How to manage in the virtual environment. You get a diverse cultured group of people. It's a win-win for everybody. More conversion from candidate leads. What does that look like in this new virtual world? Welcome, 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 everyone. It is Thursday, noon Eastern time, and you know what that means. It is time for Talent Experience Live, your weekly look at hot topics in HRs, interviews with leaders in the industry, as well as hot new HR tech covering everything that you need to know from recruitment to talent acquisition and talent management and really everything in between. Uh, as tradition around these parts, we always love to hear where everyone is tuning in from. And I started to see some comments file in. So let me know where you are joining us from and also share this to your network. Uh, if you have friends, colleagues, anyone who might be interested in hearing more about HR, definitely share this out. We do this every single Thursday at noon Eastern time. So grab some lunch, maybe an avocado toast, some coffee, whatever it may be, and tune in. And um, if you aren't able to ever catch the full episode, it is always available on Phenom's YouTube page, as well as we do a nice little blog recap uh, weekly. So that is phenom.com backslash blogs. Um, and I'm starting to see some of the comments from where people are from. It looks like Angela is joining us from Philadelphia and Samantha from New Jersey. Welcome, everyone. Today, you are in for a great topic. Uh, Jen is joining us from Ambler as well. Uh, today's topic is Movement Matters, how managers should reinvent and encourage career growth. A uh, quick little stat for you right off the bat is about 90% of employees don't know the ultimate end goal for their careers. I may be included in that 90%, but don't tell my boss. In fact, most of them don't realize their true passion until they reach a specific milestone along the talent journey, which either keeps them in route or steers them in a different direction. Today, we have a fantastic guest chatting about this. But before we jump into uh, introducing our guest, we always start off with an icebreaker question. And that first icebreaker question has to do with the movement that you go through in your career. So I want to know what everyone's first professional job was. So you're a nine to five where you didn't have to manage school or you know another particular role where it was only maybe part time. Mine specifically was an account executive trainee for a logistics organization. I was slinging freight like a, a 3PL provider should. Um, and I parlayed that actually into my first recruiter role. So shout out to the people that helped make that happen. Uh, Jason DeLuca, Amanda Gordish, Dan Mormack, John Pampalone, and anyone else that I may have forgotten. Um, it certainly got me to where I am today. Um, but again, I started off in sales and I really wasn't sure where I wanted to go. And that turned into recruitment. And now I'm talking recruitment every single Thursday here at noon. So while you are answering that question, everyone viewing from home or in the office, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe our content. Uh, we do this regularly um, and we also produce tons and tons more great content, including webinars uh, and everything in between. Looks like Michelle said that HR coordinator was her first role. I'm sure she's parlayed that into a few things along the way. And if you ever have any questions, uh, feel free to pop them into the chat or you can always reach out to us at txl at phenompeople.com if you think of something after the show or potentially want to join us as a guest. I see Jen chimes in and she says that she was assistant online media planner for an ad agency in Boston. Um, hopefully you didn't have to attend too many Red Sox or Patriots games while doing that as I am a diehard Jets fan. Anyway, I'm Devin Foster uh, and I already teased what the topic is, uh, which is movement matters and how managers should reinvent and encourage their career growth. Uh, so everyone, please join me in welcoming our very special guest, HR and talent recruitment expert, Tim Sackett. Hey, Devin. How are you? How's it going? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. How about yourself? 
No, I'm great. I'm already. I'm ready for this, right? I mean, we're live <laughs> with all these great people out here. Um, I'm sure Michelle like fell into the HR coordinator position, right? She didn't wake up like right one morning as like a seven year old girl wanting, wanting to be president or an HR coordinator. Was one of the other. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I constantly, every September, I see those first day of school pictures with the chalkboards. And it's always, I want to be a firefighter or a policeman, a professional athlete. Never once have I seen HR coordinator or recruiter. So that parlays into my first question for you, Tim. How did you kind of start your career and how did you end up in the HR space? I was born into it. Um, <laughs> no, like I did. No, this is so. This is the funny part, right? Is like my mom started the company that I currently own and run for over 40 years ago as a single mom. So I would sit um, on her bed while she was interviewing candidates, like as a nine year old kid, and she would like turn the TV on, turn the volume off. And then, you know, back then we didn't have like ATSs and all the CRM technology. She literally was using like skills checklists that she would have to send to candidates after she talked to them. So she would address the envelopes. My sister and I would stuff the envelopes, lick them, put the stamp on. And she would give us like five cents for every one we did. I think it was just to keep us shut up. I think we had a job. Um, so like when I graduated college, she kind of called and we're like, hey, we're busy. Um, you know, you should come work for me as a research assistant. And I'm like, uh, you know, and she's like, it pays 20,000. I'm like, Oh, I'm in, you know, 20,000. That's amazing. I can buy a Saturn. Um, and so I, so I went to work for her and found out it was actually a sourcing job. Right. So I did all the real recruiting and gave it to some recruiter who made all the real money and did that for a few years and kind of moved up and eventually got my master's in HR, um, from a mentor, um, you know, of a client of ours who was, you know, leading HR for their company, and decided to go and try the corporate side of HR and TA, and then eventually made it back to, to run the family business. So, well, five cents to 20 grand sounds like a hell of a raise. So, congratulations yeah. on that. She, <laughs> she thought, yeah, she thought she was giving me a raise. You know? <laughs> By the way, true story I did buy, so got a job June 1st. But went out, bought a brand new Saturn. This is when Saturns were hot. Like that was like, oh my gosh, a plastic body that will never rust in Michigan. Go get a Saturn. I had the Saturn for five days, parked out in front of my apartment. Somebody hit it head on and took off. Demolished my brand new five-day-old Saturn. You can't make a story like that up. Did you go out and get a, a brand new Saturn immediately afterwards to replace it? No, the insurance no. company was like, it's made out of plastic. We can fix it. <laughs> Uh, Tim, so I teased at the top of the show that 90% of employees don't know what they're ultimately going to do, right? And we all have those meetings with our, our management at some point that says, you know, what is your three, five, or 10 year plan? Um, if employees truly don't know how to answer that question, how can organizations change their focus on assisting them with that path? Well, I mean, again, I put it back on if you are a leader of an organization or a leader of a group, right? Like you're, so you're a team leader, you're a manager, you're whatever, and you have people that you have to develop. It's it's up to you to become this talent um, kind of agent for your people, right? The la you know, the, what you, that you should be doing is going out there and saying, hey, let's have this conversation. This is where I think I can take you. But if you don't want to go there, let's have that. Let's open this conversation up and figure out where that is. Knowing that if you're the leader that is going to, if you, if you go to me, if I get Devin, if I'm your leader and I go to you and say, Hey, I'm going to own your success. I'm going to make sure that you're going to be promoted and that you're going to be go, you know, move higher in the future. My goal is to get you, you know, to move above me you're going to be, you're like, yeah, let's go on that ride. Right. Yeah. Versus I'm the leader that just says, Hey, how do I keep my thumb on you? So you'll never go anywhere else and keep doing all this great work for me and make me look like a superstar. Right. No. And, and, and when you think about that, it, is it something that requires the organization to look at their, their, their mission and, and business results? Um, and ultimately what the company stands for, what, what sort of changes from a, a top down, can occur in that sense. Well, I mean, part of this is a little bit of this is generational. Um, I do think like we, you know, I was raised in a world where baby boomer boomers felt like, and again, broad stroke, but my, I'll, my mom was one that made, I mean, she made this exact comment when, you know, I had, I, I got to a point where I was managing a team of recruiters and I would say, Hey, look, I want to do this to develop my recruiters. And she was like, don't develop them. They'll leave. You know, you're just like, 
well, um, okay. Like they, it seemed counterintuitive. Um, and now we know like if you don't develop them, they'll leave kind of thing. Right. Like if you, it's the opposite. So I think it was just kind of this, it was this old way of thinking of saying, Hey, if you give your people more skills, you're going to make them more valuable. And then they're just going to leave you and go work someplace else. And we're like, well, that's true. If you're a really crappy boss, like, you know, like if you're a bad leader and you give somebody skills and they're more valuable, heck yeah, they're going to go work someplace else. So part of this, I think, is a leadership kind of organizational, like kind of vision dynamic that says, hey, if you're a leader in our company, you're going to be measured not, uh, I mean, you'll be measured on a lot of things. One of those is going to be obviously the performance of whatever thing you're leading, but we're also equally going to measure you on how you're developing and how you're moving your people up, Right. So like you should have like this, you know, we, you know, we were just talking basketball before we came live Which you should have this co coaching lineage, right? If you're Tom Izzo or coach K or somebody um, you should be able to point out and say, Oh yeah, I've had 10 people who've worked for me that are now in, you know, leader levels. In fact, I have people who are even above me at this point because I was that great at developing them. We don't give that kind of measure or that kind of success enough, enough noise in, in organizations. That's a that's an interesting thought, right? Uh, especially, I love the the Tom Izzo reference because it it goes the months are January, February, Izzo, April, right? That's <laughs> that's how it is. Um, but when you talk about celebrating the success of individuals, there are so many ways that you can do that. Um, what are some examples of ways that you've seen it be successful? Is it something as simple as an individual being able to to put up a LinkedIn post? Is it celebrating them in front of the organization? Um, what do what do those look like? Yeah, you know, I worked on uh, one of my first HR jobs and then became the head of TA was for Applebee's. And I had an area director who worked for me, Kim Bollinger, who every time she was in a restaurant, it didn't matter if you were a manager, if you were a cook, if you were a bartender, she would take a picture and then she would put it on Instagram or she would put it on Twitter or even Facebook and just say, and she, but, you know, and it wasn't just like, oh, hey, I, what's your name? Okay, yeah, Ted here, quick, take a picture. We're going to throw it up. It was, she would take time to say, hey, she wanted to hear their story. Like, hey, how long have you worked here? Who, where are you from? What's your, you know, family situation? Why are you working here? What do you like about it? And then she would share their story and then she would tag them, right? Like, so she tried to figure out what platform are you on? And these people would then go like, again, they were like, I was just a cook making 15 bucks an hour in, in Applebee's. And now I'm on Facebook and my mom sees it and she sees this, you know, this executive talking about how great I am. And, you know, so it was giving them kind of credence to the work that they're doing. And it doesn't matter if you're a lowly hourly employee or an executive. We all want that to happen. I remember the first time I was working head of TA for a large health system and my mother was in town and she says, Hey, do you want to go to go to lunch? And I'm like, yeah, sure. She's like, okay, I want to stop by and see your office. And I am like, this is classic mom stuff, right? Like she wants to check out to see if I'm actually, you know, made it. And so she cut in a huge HR department and I'm, you know, we're through like, through like five locked set of doors, right. In a health system. Mm -hmm. And so it just turns out that she's fumbling around trying to find her way in the CHRO who was my boss actually um, said, hey, ma'am, can I help you? And she's like, well, I'm looking for Tim Sackett. And he, she, he goes, well, ironically, my office is right next to his. And so as they were walking, he was telling her like, you know, all these really great things and blowing me up. So by the time she got to me, she, you know, you know, the, the best thing ever is that your mom like just got told, right. That, you know, that this, you know, that you were, you were actually good, you know? And so I, I do think we have the ability of leaders to really go out. I tell people all the time, like I used to send um, notes out to, to new hires. So when I hired a new recruiter, even somebody that was experienced, but it works really well with entry level, like new grad college, because usually the person still has like their, their home address as their real address, right? Like for their tax forms, you know, just in case that crappy studio apartment doesn't work out. <laughs> and I would send thank you notes to their parents without telling them that it, I was sending a thank you note for, Hey, I want to thank you for Devin. Um, he, you know, he's come in, he's done all this great work for us and you guys have raised and, you know, and developed a really great kid. Again, like I, people would come back to me and be like, Oh my gosh, like my parents called me and they can't, you know, th this is the greatest, like the greatest thing ever. Now, 
there was some risk there, right? Like I could have said, I could have sent up like a, a thank you note to a parent that, you know, they were just, dis- you know, separated from and had like this horrible upbringing or whatever. Thankfully that never happened. <laughs> like, you know. And usually you can kind of tell, right. As going through interview selection process, working with somebody, you know, do they, do they, are they, st- do they still have like this great kind of, you know, working relationship with their family, you know? It's a it's a great story. I, I love the the handwritten letter gesture as well. I know one thing that we do at Phenom, which has um, really been, I think, cool to see is when we celebrate people um, on a quarterly basis who are living our core values. Um, we don't just showcase them in front of the organization. We also outreach to their family, get them to send in some personal videos. Maybe they're a little bit goofy. Maybe they're from the heart. Um, but I've never thought about it from that way where it also showcases to your family and your loved ones that you're doing a good job, that you're being recognized. Um, yeah. And everybody wants to, to make their mom and their, their dad proud at the end of the day. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to do that. Uh, it, yeah. It, even with experienced people, it works with like significant others, um, yes. you know, spouses, any of that. Like, again, you want to know, like, you know, my wife knows I go to work every day. And she'll ask me like, what happened? And I'm always kind of like at a point where I was like, yeah, same old, same old, you know, but it would be nice if like, well, I guess I'm the boss. So I'd have to send her <laughs> for myself. Like, Hey, your husband's awesome. You should take care of him. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. You start writing that, that letter from yourself already. I think that that will serve the purpose. Um, but we talked a, a bit about that, that change that, that people go through in their careers. So what if uh, hypothetically there is a product marketer named Devin who, who realizes he doesn't want to be a product marketer forever. How can the individual have that conversation with their boss? And then also how can leaders encourage those conversations? And everyone loves the, I have an open door policy, but that's an intimidating conversation to have, right? To, to raise your hand and say, I don't know if I want to do this forever. How can you mm-hmm. encourage those lines of communication? Again, I, I, I still think it, it should be owned by the leader. I know when I hire somebody as a recruiter, especially entry level, we, are, we hire a lot of entry level college um, kids with various degrees and then teach them how to recruit. And it's always been really successful for us. But one of the things I will tell them when we hire them is like, look, it's, it's kind of like, what's the, um, the Liam Neeson in the taken thing. I'm going to give you a set of skills <laughs> <laughs> and you can use these skills anywhere in the world, in any industry, and you can make money and be valuable. The, cr- the thing is, I don't know if you actually like it. I don't know if you'll like doing this job. You might not like it. You might hate it. We might hate you, right? At the end of the day, if you don't like it or we don't like you, the one thing I can give you is that we're going to be very transparent about this entire conversation all the way through training, all the way through your performance. And I've had people, I had a person, I we had actually hired a person right at college, worked, I mean, two or three years as a recruiter was actually really good, but we do technical recruiting, engineering recruiting, and he actually fell in love with engineering. And he was like, Tim, I think I want to be an engineer. I think that's where my passion will be. So he started taking night classes, recruiting during the day. We were helping pay for his engineering degree. And eventually he get, he graduated and then we helped him get his engineering job. And, you know, and he made that transition. I think that's like a great example of how leaders should take a different look at it, right? It's one thing, what usually happens is the person, Devin goes, hey, I don't want to be in product marketing. And the performance starts to go down because you're just disengaged with it, right? You're just like, I don't like this job, but I need the job. Instead of saying, hey, how do we keep your engagement really high, your performance really high and help you get to that next step? Because by the way, if I know, if we know that that timeline, we're sharing all this information, we're being transparent, and I know like, hey, it looks like within 12 months, Devin's going to have whatever skill sets or degrees he needs to get to that next level. It allows me to hire somebody and get them trained up so that there's no gap in in service of, for the employee side either, right? So I know I'm not going to miss anything. Like it just makes sense all the way around by doing that instead of saying like, well, Dev, what if I give you 50 cents more an hour? What if I uh, let you work from home on Fridays? And trying to find ways to increase engagement that is literally just short-term stuff that eventually still gets going to end up to the same the same end result. Yeah, no, I, I think that that is, is true. And it reminds me of, of when I was a recruiter back in the day um, and counter offers, right? Essentially, when somebody's saying, hey, I'm interested in, in this, um, the organization is counter offering and saying, hey, I'll give you off you know, on Fridays or uh, you can work from home on Fridays or here's 50 cents. 
nine times out of 10, that never works out the way that it is initially planned. Um, so when we talk about adding skills, and, and you mentioned Liam Neeson, I'm gonna give you a set of skills to with them <laughs> at what you will. Uh, <laughs> my, my next thought is, is there a correlation between adding skills that maybe aren't directly connected to the role that you have? For instance, if there is a recruiter who is really passionate about um, design or photography or, or something along those lines, where you encourage them to build up those skills and use them in their day-to-day -day process so that it's beneficial for those both parties. Yeah. I mean, again, sometimes it's difficult to, to actually get to that state. But I, when I, one of the things, like I was really against when we took a look at like Workday and Oracle came out with their internal mobility um, kind of career site or um, technology, right? And they announced that and there was this big push. And I was like, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Is this really, the, I don't, you know, I just, I didn't see, I didn't connect the dots. But then as we start to hear the data around, you know, how much it's being used by organizations and internal mobility that are using those, 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 those pieces of technology, it's crazy. Turns out, you know, a lot of people in our organizations it just, I mean, when I say internal mobility and like gig kind of stuff yeah. and having internal gigs, it's about saying, oh gosh, somebody, I'm, I'm doing a recruiter job, but like, I know I have some coding skills and they need 10 hours, you know, or they need a hundred hours of project work. It's get over 12 weeks uh, um, coding and I want to keep up my skill sets in coding or whatever that might be. There's all kinds of stuff. Could be marketing, could be social media stuff, um, project based. Hey, we're going to build some new, you know, you know, kind of survey, you know, tool, whatever. Um, I think those are great ways for people to say, hey, I want to continue to use this capacity. What we've seen, especially with the pandemic and the remote hybrid kind of work world is as you're as you're cutting down people's commute time and just, you know, being in the office and how hard it is to get work done in the office. We're seeing a lot of employees that actually have a little bit extra capacity. Right. And then they're, they're like, hey, how do I how do I sharpen my skills or how do I add skills and what can I do? And so I love this and this all the internal gig stuff that's going on. Um, from that, I think again, there's 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 potential like comp issues and different things down the road with all this, yeah. but at the same time, like it's it's amazing to see how many of our employees are reaching out for those opportunities when they're given a chance versus saying, "Hey, I'm waiting for my leader to give me an opportunity." Yeah, no, and, and I think technology is a, a huge asset in this, right? We've all transitioned to this digital world. Commute times have disappeared for in, in a lot of situations, not for everyone, but in a lot. And that time allows people to look at what opportunities and what skills they may be passionate about and how they can stick with their organization. I know when we talked previously, um, we, we mentioned, you know, the, that career man or woman or, or company man or woman who stays with an organization for a long time. And it sounds like, you know, these internal mobility and employee experience are the answer for that. But you mentioned gigs there and immediately it an idea popped in my head where it's an opportunity to say, hey, this interests me a little bit. Let me test it out, right? As I think so many people can relate to early on in their careers, they're attracted to the shiny object, right? Is I the grass is always greener on the other side. This gives people the opportunity to predict, predict how it will, will play out with a really low risk. Um, have you heard of a lot of those success stories um, as these technologies roll out? I know that they're early on, um, but any, any success that you've seen there? You know, the ones we hear the most success are going to be ones where it's not like um, expert skill required kind of thing, right? Because like if I need somebody to, you know, you know, code or, or, you know, do something that has like a really high skill level involved for a gig, I actually need the skill. I can't have you like, I'm not teaching you the skill. So, but when we have things of like, you know, that are, that are like, we, we feel like with a little bit of, it's just a really kind of an effort based kind of gig, right? Like, Hey, I need, you know, three people to get together in a room and knock out, you know, a program around, um, you know, uh, employee advocacy or something like that. So, you know, like there's not a, like a real skill there. It's really just the work of brainstorming, being creative, you know, some of those kinds of things, and then actually build, you know, those things we're seeing, like we're definitely having that. I do think, the hard part with um, the internal gig side is a lot of people might look at it and go, oh, hey, there's a great internal gig and I have a lot of passion. And so they want to apply, but they just don't have that skill set, right? And, so that, and that, that, that employee, that employee, the boss or the leader who's actually has that internal gig kind of has to go 
sorry, like I would love to give you this opportunity, but right, you, you don't yeah. actually have the skill. And then you're like, well, how do I get the skill if I, you know, if I don't have the opportunity? And it's like at that point, right? I think that's where HR should needs to step in and say, Hey, you you said you wanted this, clearly you didn't get it. Is there other kinds of on-demand training developed that we can give you to help get you to that skill so that the next time that gig comes up, you will be the candidate that they will want to try, right? Yeah. Um, and the other thing I, I think about, um, and I've worked for a, a lot of uh, relatively smaller organizations, right, where I bump into people at the water cooler as I'm talking about the Jets and how they lost last week and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but a lot of con uh, conversations and connections between departments happen that way. Um, to avoid maybe some of these things that, that you mentioned where somebody raises their hand for their gigs, they don't have that opportunity. Um, are these employee experience and internal mobility technologies assisting with having those conversations before it's time to tell somebody no, um, or before it's time to recommend a learning course, uh, where you can kind of see where somebody's skill set is before you have that difficult conversation. Again, I, I, you know, this really goes back to the beginning of the conversation, which is, you know, a leader should be owning that. For me, if I'm going to build an internal gig, internal mobility process, one of the first steps is I don't want to hinder a person applying for a, an internal mobility or an internal gig position. I want them to go ahead and do it. But right after they apply, the first, the first next very first step should be you need to go have this conversation with your leader, right? And you're, and not that I need necessarily a leader sign off because I think that's problematic as well, but I want my leader to understand, Hey, this is why I'm doing this. And here's where this is going and all that good stuff. And then from there, then the next step could be, okay, Hey, once you've had this conversation and you click whatever, like, yeah, we both said, you know, we've talked to each other about this because the last thing I want as a leader is to be surprised by somebody I, that reports to me saying, Hey, Devin just, you know, applied to, for this other position and I had no idea. One, shame on me for not knowing and shame on me for not having the relationship with you that you didn't feel comfortable enough to come and tell me, hey, by the way, I'm going to apply for this job and me being able to say, hey, I'm going to set you up for success with that job. I, I know that manager. I'm going to make sure I get a good word in for you um, and let him know all of your strengths. But I think we we have to be able to kind of make sure we drive those conversations back um, and then again, going back to that talent agent concept of a leader and saying, hey, how do we make sure all of our leaders, because here's what we know is we know there's going to be certain leaders that automatically gravitate. They're, they're a talent agent the day that we gave them the keys to be a leader. And then we're going to have some people that are just awful at it and they're just going to be controlling and they're not going to want to lose anybody. And they're going to see somebody leaving them you know, you know, I'm Jewish. So like, I mean, they're going to tear their shirt and you're dead to me now. And, you know, they're going to have this negative perception, which they shouldn't, right? Like anytime you have somebody move internally to their next position, that should be a celebration. It should never be a negative. And too often in the history of internal mobility, it's been a negative for one person. It's been a positive for another. And I think that's where we have to figure out as talent acquisition, HR leaders, how do we make that a great positive for both sides? How are we celebrating both, right? Celebrating the leader for moving somebody on and then also celebrating that employee for their new position. I, I, absolutely. And I think the other big aspect of this is succession planning that, that comes along with it, right? That's it's expensive to, to replace an employee. And if you don't allow for those opportunities and them to move within an organization and you, you take it personally, um, it's going to come with a, a, pretty, a pretty big price tag. So um, how can those conversations be had where you can start to have a conversation, not only with somebody on your team who's looking to move, but also, hey, now we have this opportunity. Let's look internally. How, how should those sort of things go or, or what should the technology look like there? You know, the succession for me, the money discussion of succession planning is always funny because I think we worry about the money of succession way more than our C-suite ever worries about it. So, and I give like the example being if, you know, I knew I was going to lose somebody, like would this happened in Applebee's where we had, we had manpower plans, right? If you were fully staffed, you had a hundred managers and we could never go over right? Because, oh my gosh, at that point you're burning too much, but we always had this constant churn, right? So 
you're always going to have two or three openings or you're always going to have somebody in flux and transition. And we would get yelled at by our C-suite for not being fully staffed. And I'm like, well, but as soon as I fill that hundredth position, two weeks later, I have somebody leaving and, you know, and there's, there's, it's really difficult to have like this pipeline of on demand, you know, people ready to be trained and run. But at, so then we would talk about the expense of having to go out and find and recruit and the attraction and the, and the loss of having to pay somebody overtime because they're picking up the hours for, uh, you know, being down a manager or whatever that might be. And so eventually we're in this big boardroom, we're having this conversation, the entire C-suite's there and the CFO is there. And I just, I'm like, and once the CFO was involved, then it was like a different, total different conversation because they understood the financial impact that, Hey, we were paying more in other places. It might be spread out over four different buckets, but you're so worried about maintaining financials on one side of the ledger that you're blowing up the other side of the ledger and not even paying attention to it. You're paying overtime, you're paying headhunting fees, you're paying recruitment marketing fees. If you would just go hire 103 managers instead of 100, you would actually save us 25% of the cost. And in this, and then like, you know, everyone kind of looks at the CFO and they're like, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> like, stop, stop being dumb. <laughs> like, start being smarter about financial spend and what we're actually trying to do. And then when you start thinking that way, succession then doesn't become as expensive as it seems. You know, and it, part of that is also being able to have this conversation of, we always think that we're, like, if, I, if a position is go, goes unfilled, unless it's a sales position, hey, we're actually saving money because we're not paying that salary, we're not paying those benefits. So even though I want to have that position filled because, you know, it has an impact, I'm actually not really, it's not really costing us money. In fact, if we people are working harder and pulling up their bootstraps, you know, we're probably saving a little bit of money. And again, backwards thinking of, no, if that position's filled, there should be a direct impact to the financials, either on, on customer, guest service, client service, on margin, on overall revenue. And if you can't tie that position to those financial things, then why are we hiring that person? It's, it's, an, interesting, yeah, it's an interesting way to look at it. And um, it, it's, it's crazy to, to imagine um, you know, being almost overstaffed in, in preparation for the eventual turnover that happens because it, it so few organizations actually do that. Right. And we that's don't not something we know, that- right. If the, the one thing we know is our turnover retention numbers. That's probably the best stat we have in all of HR talent acquisition. If you know your churn rate is 14%, 20%, 8%, then why aren't we hiring to that rate versus going, because what what ends up being is we're constantly chasing our tail to to be fully staffed. It's crazy. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's almost like um, it's, I love analogies. So so bear with me on this one. But when you're driving your car, right? It's uh, waiting till your tank hits completely empty before you fill it versus stopping and getting gas along your road trip, right? Uh, sure. Running the risk of of running out and being on the side of the road, which I've done a few too many times. Uh, <laughs> but the last question that I have for you here, um, and it, it's a little bit different, but with this increase of technology focused on employee experience and internal mobility and gigs, are you seeing in, in your conversations a lot more organizations hire for almost internal recruiters, if you will, people that are in charge of referrals specifically, in charge of gig networks specifically, in charge of internal mobility. Um, and you know, is this a, a nuance? Is this something that is, is going to grow or is it just something that's kind of hot and happening right now? You know, what's really unique is, and I think this is a workday stat. And they, so what they did when they, when they decided to develop the internal kind of um, marketplace that they, that they developed, and I'm sure Oracle has the same numbers. Um, they showed that most positions in organizations in the fortune, like 1000, right? So enterprise organizations, it was like 60% of positions are actually filled internally before they ever hit external. And so there, there was already what they found was there was already a big part of recruiters jobs was literally just like kind of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, right? It was like, oh, this person moved from here to here and that opened a position here. And then that person, that person moved over here and it was all just this logistical kind of thing. And so obviously the technology helps, but I, I do think that organizations are finding out like, hey, if half of our positions are filled internally we probably need people just focused on 
that kind of movement, right? And whatever that might look like. And then, right, you can start really digging into the data to find out, hey, do we have certain divisions, locations that are feeder programs, right, that we know everybody's moving out of here, there's high churn, we keep beating up that manager, that leader, because they turn over so many people, but the turnover actually is really good for the overall organization, because they're feeding the rest of the organization with really good talent. So how do we stop beating that person up and help that person, right? How do we give them more resources and let them overhire, like get big, get, let them put more people into the organization? Because what we do know is that we have certain leaders that are great at selection, whatever it is they have in their gut, in their mind, however they interview, you, they're just better than you and I at selecting, or they're better at attracting, right? We also have leaders that are just great at attracting high level talent. And then we have leaders that are awful at it. They're awful at selection, they're awful at attraction, and we need to prop them up. And so I do think like having individuals that are focused on that internal side and really being able to dig into the numbers ultimately strengthens the organization. And, and one piece that goes along with that is, is celebrating that individual who has that, that high turnover. I know we, we talked about it early on in the episode, but um, maybe that is a way for organizations to allow for managers to be more receptive to some of these conversations, to start to have them earlier because uh, so-and-so over in sales is being very successful with growing them and having these people have very long tenures at your organizations. Um, so maybe take the time, write a handwritten letter to their family, loved ones, significant other, whoever it may be, um, and celebrate them, right? By the way, like the, the leader like that is producing and putting a lot of people into the organization, do, you know, don't discount the fact that that's a really hard, stressful position there and as well, because if you're constantly having to hire new and constantly having, you know, to train only to lose your good talent like understand like how hard that job is and that, you know, we see hard burnout in that. Like I was at the health system and we had nursing managers and we, we knew like we could, you could go through and take a look at their, you know, at who they had moved on and who they had hired and some had a higher turnover, but they were moving those people into higher level nursing jobs. So they were great at giving opportunity, great at teaching, great at, at encouraging people to move into, you know, critical care nursing and different like higher level, like levels of nursing, but like when you, when I would meet and talk with those nurses, they seemed, those nursing managers, they almost seem like just beat down and tired, right? They were just like, I'm saying like, I'm like, I, it's like, I'm never off this treadmill. And so sometimes we have to give them a break. Like we're like, Hey, you know what? We're going to move you in to this role for a year. You're going to keep, you're going to keep your nursing you know leadership title, but we want you to work on this special project. We want you to do something else because Otherwise, we just risk losing them, you know, to, you know, to another organization or to a position where they won't be in that position to want to grow talent. And so, again, we have to be cognizant of these leaders that we continue to press on that grow talent. They're really good at growing talent. It's also a really stressful job. No, it, it reminds me of, of college basketball, right? With the, the one and done year uh, where these athletes come in yeah. and, and coaches have to recruit. Unfortunately, you know, your managers aren't going to make that $10 million a year that yeah. Krzyzewski yeah. is yeah. Or, or Roy Williams is. So, um, Tim, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I want to hand the floor over to you. Anything that you'd like to shout out, promote, I'll give the floor to you uh, before we sign off. No, I mean, if people want to connect, obviously on LinkedIn or uh, any of the social channels, it's, I'm pretty easy to find at Tim Sackett. I'm a, I'm a big connector. Come out and ask questions. Um, the book's out there. You can get it on Amazon. It's called The Talent Fix. And it's been really successful. Um, and it's, it, you know, I wrote it with the understanding. Of, I've been writing on the internet forever. So timsackett.com, it's like 10 years of writing every day. But um, the book was all about, hey, if I came into your shop, um, most of, and after writing for 10 years, you get, I get questions like every single day from people and they're like, and it usually starts out with like, yeah, Hey, I took on this TA leader job and we're broken. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, help me. How do, and so I wrote the book like, Hey, if I came in as a consultant or just running your shop, here's exactly what I do like from day one. And, um, I've gotten like literally all over the world, such great like feedback from it. So I'm really excited and happy about that. Um, but again, you can find me easy. Just Google Tim Sackett. It's me and a truck driver chaplain in Minnesota. I'm not the truck driver chaplain. I stole all of his SEO. It would be awesome if I was Tim Sackett recruiter guy and truck driver chaplain. That would be amazing, but I'm not. Yeah. Be, I spend my weekends just going from truck stops to truck stops. <laughs>
<laughs> Big for a great about. bumper sticker. <laughs> um, no, Tim, this is awesome. We will uh, we'll, we'll put the uh, your information in the blog recap and uh, as long as, as well as your book. Uh, but thank you so much. I'll let you get back to watching Michigan State. I know I All pulled right. you away from that, so I apologize. And hopefully we connect soon again. All right. Thanks, Devin. Awesome. How are we going? There you have it. That was Tim Sackett talking all around how movement matters within your organizations and how managers can really enable employee growth within your company. Uh, before we go, I do want to share uh, a very special episode that we had last week around uh, job empowerment and growth with ways to support women at work. Last week uh, on the show, we had Becky Fieldman, uh, Assistant Vice President and Senior of Employee Experience Design at Commerce Bank, as well as Trish Holiday, who is uh, a private consulting uh, and also a public educator, as well as speaker and strategist. Uh, we talked a ton and it was an amazing episode. I'm going to air the clip right now, but if you still have time left in your day or even this evening, definitely check out the full episode on YouTube or Phenom. But here's the clip. How do we set our women up for success in the work environment? Um, to show women that you can succeed there and that it is a woman-friendly organization. Yeah, and I think you hit it, Becky. It's got to start with the top leadership. Mm -hmm. And we got to talk about the type of culture that we want. And do we invite mm -hmm. continuous improvement thinking? Mm -hmm. Because if we do, then this intrapreneurship. So it, it think of it in terms of internal entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, think of it that you are saying to your workforce, hey, if a process isn't as efficient as you think it should be, or if, if a procedure feels cumbersome, uh, let's, I invite you to think about that. I invite you to, to reimagine uh, that particular process or procedure. And now all of a sudden the innovation is coming from bottom up and mm -hmm feel empowered. And so this is where I think women would are really thrive in environments like this, because um, when you invite women to say, you know, I've been in this role, here's the industry, and then you're inviting them to help you think differently about how a particular business process could be done, mm -hmm. it really frees people from being caught in that fixed mindset. Again, great episode last week, great episode this week. If you're just catching this now, catch the replay either on LinkedIn or on YouTube or on phenom.com backslash blogs. Thank you everyone for chiming in. I did see a last second comment from Holly. I apologize for not mentioning Coach Calipari of the Kentucky Wildcats. Won't happen again, uh, but thank you, Jen. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, uh, Raj. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tom. We really appreciate it. We can't do the show without you. Uh, tune in next Thursday. We have another great episode, noon Eastern time. Um, and everyone, enjoy the rest of your week and hopefully weekend. We'll see you next week.